The last type of reaction we're going to be talking about in this chapter is something called an oxidation reduction reaction. The idea behind this is that oxi so you'll sometimes so we have oxidation reduction reactions. Now, you will also sometimes see them called redox reactions. Now, these are going to be reactions that involve electron movement. So it's ha so in these we're going to have one atom in our reaction is going to gain electrons while another one loses them. They're called this one common reason for this name is you notice the word oxidation. So many redox reactions are going to involve the reaction of the substance oxygen, which will be resolved in oxidizing different things. So that's where the name comes from for that part. So let's look at what one of these reactions is and what the parts of it that make it up. So an oxidation reduction reaction has two parts. So first, something in the reaction is oxidized. And what that means is that atom loses electrons. The other part of the reaction is something is reduced. This is the atom that gains electrons. Now, to help memorize, to help remember this, you can use different mnemonic devices. I personally like the one that I was taught when I was a student, which is oil rig. So oil rig means that oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain. So this is the one I use, there are some others, but this is one I found most useful for me. So in, for a reaction to be an oxidation reduction reaction, something has to be oxidized and something has to be reduced. This is always gonna happen as a pair since if something lost the electrons, they have to go somewhere. So when one thing loses, the other is going to gain. So what does this look like? So let's start by looking at single atoms where we can think about this. So for example, the sodium atom, if it becomes sodium plus one with plus one electron, then this reaction is an oxidation reaction. The reason for that is the sodium atom is losing its electron or one of its electrons, not all of them. On the other hand, let's say we want to look at a reduction. That's where something gains electrons. So let's see the molecule Cl2. We're going to react it with two electrons, and it's going to form two Cl minus ions. So this is reduction here because chlorine started off neutral. So Cl2, chlorine, remember, is one of our diatomic elements. So when it's combined together, both chlorine atoms are neutral. But if you add two electrons, you're able to make two chlorine minus ions. So since chlorine changed from neutral to a negative ion, it became negatively charged. And we would say that it was reduced because reduction is gain, while oxidation is loss. And yes, I know that terminology can be annoying sometimes, the idea that reduction is a gain of electrons, but that's the terminology that's used, so we have to be consistent with it. So how do we figure this out? So the way we're gonna identify if something gains or loses electrons in an overall reaction is we have to look at it combined. We're not gonna see it like this, instead we're gonna see something like two sodium solid plus chlorine gas is gonna to react to form two NaCl solid. So this is a combination of those two reactions where sodium chloride, remember, is an ionic compound where sodium's plus one and chlorine's minus one. Now, in cases like this ionic compound is one of the more straightforward because we have those charges we can apply to things. So on the left, sodium and chlorine started off neutral. On the right, sodium became plus one and chlorine became minus one. But you can do this even with things that aren't ionic compounds. We'll still send them see electrons be transferred. So to do this, to figure this out, we need a set of rules that we can always assign any atom in our reaction how many electrons we want to treat it like it has to figure out if electrons have moved. So to do this, we use something called an oxidation state. So this is just, so we're going to use oxidation states to determine where electrons are flowing. So this is going to be a set of rules that chemists use to determine 
where the electrons are. So the reason this sounds kind of awkwardly worded is we want to emphasize the fact that oxidation states, I'm oh, sorry about that, are something that chemists have invented as a set of rules to try to track things, that this isn't something like I can directly measure. And we say that because ionic charges, like in sodium chloride, that creates an Na plus and a Cl minus, and those are things that you can measure. You can actually measure that has a positive and negative charge, but that's not true with oxidation states. Oxidation states function as a bookkeeping tool. They're still helpful to us. They let us know, okay, we're going to treat it like the electrons went from this atom to this atom, but they're not the same as something that we can directly measure like a charge. And that's important to emphasize because I think it's easy to get the two confused between them. So ionic charges are things I can directly measure of that ion that was created, whereas oxidation states are going to be a way to track where the electrons are going, but I can't always measure that the same way. It's also important to note that sometimes the, the two will be the same thing. So sometimes your ionic charge will actually be what your oxidation state is, but other cases you don't have an ionic charge, you have to have a way to define it. So to deal with this, we have a set of rules. So with any molecule in a reaction or atom, you can assign it an oxidation state. And so we have a total of seven rules to work through. So we're going to start with rule one. Three elements have an oxidation state of zero. So what this means is if you have sodium just in your reaction by itself, that's going to be a zero. So this is by itself. Once it's combined with something, these rules aren't true anymore. This is also true if you have a molecule with just one type of atom. So for example, O2, still zero because it's oxygen connected to itself. So chlorine, Cl2, would also be the same way. So any atom, if it's by itself or only connected to others of the same type, is going to have an oxidation state of zero. And the idea behind these rules is you apply them in order. So some of these, it doesn't really make sense to think of it that way because if rule one applies, of course, the others aren't going to. But sometimes you might have competing rules. You've got to figure out which to work from. So you're going to do these in the order that they're listed. So you treat it like a checklist. Now, rule two, monoatomic ions. have an oxidation state equal to their charge. So the first couple of rules are the easiest generally, have an oxidation state equal to their charge. So what does that mean? So for example, if you have a reaction that has sodium plus in it, not sodium neutral, that is an oxidation state of plus one. On the other hand, if you had a Cl minus, that would have an oxidation of minus one. Now, rule three is actually one of our more use. It's going to be a really useful rule, and we're going to use it a lot. So, the sum of all oxidation states of all atoms in a neutral compound. is zero. So for example, when we said NaCl, once I know that Na is plus one, Cl has to be minus one because NaCl is overall neutral. And also once I know Cl is minus one, then Na has to be plus one. The reason this rule is really important is <coughs> as we go further down the rules, we'll start getting new ways to assign atoms. But when you have a compound, once you've assigned all but one of the atoms, rule three comes into play. So to give you an idea for later, so we'll, we'll learn a lot of different rules as we go about this, but let's say we take the molecule CO2. You don't know the rules for how to assign it yet. But if I tell you there's a rule that's gonna apply that's gonna say this oxygen has an oxidation state of minus two, once you know that, then you can say that carbon has to be a plus four. That's because there are two oxygens, and if each is a minus two, that would make it minus four overall for the molecule. And carbon's the last atom. And rule three says all of the atoms have to add up to zero for a neutral compound. 
So once you learn a rule about why oxygen is minus two, if you knew that, then carbon would have to be a plus four to balance it. So this rule is going to be the one that helps us with atoms. We're going to go through all our rules till we get down to one atom left in a molecule, and then we'll use this rule if it's a neutral compound. Now, there's a corollary to rule three. So our fourth rule, and honestly, I think you can remember, you can learn three and four together. So four is that the sum of oxidation states for all atoms in a polyatomic ion are equal to the charge of the ion. So this is the corollary to rule three, which is we can apply this rule also to things that are charged. So for example, let's take NO3 minus. So NO3 minus, oxygen is gonna equal minus two, and nitrogen is gonna equal plus five. And we'll learn how to assign those in a bit, but this makes sense with our rule. Oxygen's minus two, there are three of them, which gets us to minus six, but then you add five, and you're left with a single negative left over, which matches the charge on NO3 minus. So rule three is for neutral compounds. Four is for our polyatomic ions that have charges. So if it's neutral overall, all of them have to add up to zero. If it's charged overall, because for example, it's a polyatomic ion, all of the oxidation states have to add up to that charge. So these two rules are helpful once we get down to only one atom remaining, in either a polyatomic ion or an overall compound. Now, the fifth rule I'm going to look at is going to be group one metals are plus one in compounds. And then rule six is related. Group two metals, so that's the second column in the periodic table, are plus two in compounds. So for example, if I have MgCl2, Mg has to be plus two because it's in group two. And since we're down to one atom, the chlorine has to be minus one because it's the last remaining atom and it's gotta be neutral for the compound MgCl2. So this is how we assign our oxidation states. Now there's one more rule, and this one is gonna be basically all the remaining atoms we have to worry about. And so these are assigned in order. So for our last rule, rule seven, which is going to be kind of long, we've got a bunch of different atoms that we have to assign in a certain order. So this is how we're going to assign our non-metals. This is the order in which they get assigned. We do fluorine first, then hydrogen, then oxygen. And these have values of minus one, plus one, minus two. We then do, let me, one second, let me grab this. Okay. Okay, there are two different labels, so I wanted to make sure I used both of them. So then the, the next group we do are, you either will call them group, make sure you use the right label, 7A or group 17, depending on your label. These are the halogens. So the halogens other than fluorine, things like chlorine, bromine, these are all going to be minus one. You then have group 6A or group 16. These are the things oxygen, under oxygen, oxygen's already been assigned. You assign these minus two. You then have group 5A or group 15. You assign these minus three. So the idea behind these rules is you use them in order to assign your oxidation states. So it depends on the molecule you're working with what order you're going to apply all these things in. Or not what order, but which ones are going to come up. Because, for example, we did something earlier with nitrogen. You'll notice when I said we did NO3 minus. Well, the way I assign this ah, is that my rule 7 says I do oxygen before I do group 5A which is where nitrogen would be. 
So I use the rule for oxygen, and I assign that this oxygen is minus two. Once I've gotten down to one atom, which is the nitrogen left, I quit using rule seven because rule four will take precedence. I have to make this overall equal to negative one because that's the charge of my ion. So if oxygen's minus two, and there are three of them, that's a minus six, this nitrogen has to be a plus five, which is not what this says down here. So that's why we have to learn these rules in order. Because once we get down to the last atom, you don't have to use these specific rules about, oh, it's minus two or minus three. That atom gets decided by what all the other atoms around it are. So let's take another, let's say that instead we had NO3 and it was neutral. Oxygen would still be minus two, but now this nitrogen would be a plus six if we were to have that type of assignment. Because it has to balance out to a neutral molecule. So let's take a look at a couple of examples using these rules. So I want you to try assigning Kf, calcium F2, SO4, 2 minus, and OF2. So give that a shot, and we'll go over them in just a moment. So pause me, try them first. Now let's take a look at them. So Kf are earlier rules about metals say that K has to be plus one. That means F has to be minus one. So those are our two oxidation states. Then we've got a second example that's similar. We have calcium fluoride. Calcium has to be a plus two according to our rules. So to make this neutral, fluorine has to be a minus one. We then have FSO4, two minus. This oxygen has to be a minus two oxidation state. And so four times negative two is negative eight. And we want a two minus overall. So this sulfur has to be a plus six oxidation state. And then finally, for OF2, we knew our rule for fluorine became our, was before our rule for oxygen. So fluorine has to be a minus one oxidation state. Since there are two of them, that means this oxygen has to be a plus two. I used OF2 as a specific example. Oxygen is almost always minus two. But here was a counterexample where since fluorine's rule came earlier, we would assign its oxidation state first. Oxygen would be the last remaining atom. It would be plus two rather than the minus two that we've usually been assigning it to. You could also have something like O2 that's neutral and then oxygen would be zero. So it's important to keep that in mind that some of the rules you'll use a lot and you'll get used to, okay, this is almost always this, but then you have to take into account, well, what about when it's in this exact setup? On the positive side though, there aren't that, that, that set of rules isn't that long. So once you get practiced at them, you get really familiar with it. You can get a good feel for, okay, I check this first, then this, then this. And it comes like the systematic thing that you go through. What you may notice with everything I just said is everything so far has been about single molecules, about what gains and loses electrons. But for chemical reactions, I'm going to need to track this for more than one thing. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So in reactions, we want to identify what is oxidized and what is reduced. So let's take this reaction. Carbon plus two sulfur reacts to form CS2. So Initially, the carbon and sulfur are both oxidation state zero because they're atoms by themselves. We then go to apply our rules for this other molecule. The sulfur has to be a minus two because sulfur is in group 6A. Then to make this overall neutral, this carbon has to be a plus four. Since we have two negative twos, you need a plus four to balance it. So let's say my question was, what is oxidized? So from earlier in the video, Oxidation is loss for oil rig. So that means what lost electrons. So if we look here, you can see that the carbon goes from zero to plus four. Since it's going up every time it loses an electron, it doesn't change the number of protons. So if you're losing negative charges, you're gonna become more positively charged. So we look for identifying what became more positive, and that was carbon here. So it is what was oxidized. Then we also have the question of what is reduced. So here, if we see sulfur goes from zero to minus two, it became more negative. That's how we know that it was reduced. So this is how you solve the problems. 
you find the atoms on the left and right side and compare their oxidation states and look for the ones that change. Note that some of the atoms aren't going to change at all. You'll definitely have atoms where they just stay the same, and those, while they're present, aren't being oxidized or reduced. They're just staying the same. And if everything stays the same, then you can say that nothing was changed, so there wasn't a redox reaction at all. So you have to see some change. If you assign all the values and they're all equal, that means there was no oxidation reduction occurring. I also need to bring something up here that is term, a piece of terminology that can sometimes be kind of frustrating, but it, it's based on the context that people use these terms in, where, why it can make sense to use. And since it's used, I have to bring it up. So we mentioned that carbon was oxidized in this case. Well, the thing that is oxidized, that means the thing that lost electrons, it caused something else to gain them. That means we can also call this the reducing agent. What that term means is what caused something else to be reduced. And then similarly for the sulfur, since the sulfur was gaining electrons, it was taking them away from something else. So it was causing something else to lose them. So it was the oxidizing agent. We will use both of these terms. And if you want to think about it in sort of a chemist term of what this might look like in a laboratory, many times I might have a reaction where I'm like, okay, I need to take electrons away from this. So since I want to take the electrons away, I need an oxidizing agent, something that's going to make them go away. Or maybe I want to give electrons to something, so I want a reducing agent. So that's why we use the terminology that way. In other cases, we're looking at a reaction we want to identify, what lost, what gained. So then we talk about what is oxidized and what's reduced. So you just have to keep the terminology clear, but there is a reason for it. It tends to be context dependent, which word makes more sense to use. And so that's why the thing that is oxidized, so remember, oxidized is loss of electrons. So either we'll have it be oxidized because the carbon was oxidized, or if you think in the context of something causing something else to lose, in this case, the sulfur caused something else to lose electrons, so it was the oxidizing agent. It was the cause of the loss of electrons because it gained them. So that's where that terminology comes from for it. Now, let's finish this up by looking at a rea another reaction where you have to identify which ones gain and lose. I don't have another slide, so I'll have to clear this one off. Pointer options, erase all ink. There we go. So I want you to take this reaction. We have magnesium solid plus water. And it's going to react to form magnesium hydroxide plus hydrogen gas. I want you to identify, I'll write it down. So what, my, there we go, my pen stopped on my screen. What is oxidized? What is reduced? And then to use the other terminology, what is the oxidizing agent, which I'm going to stand with OA, so that's oxidizing agent, and what is the reducing agent? Reducing agent. All right, so in case you're just looking at the screen and you aren't hearing me, that might look weird. So I want you to give this a try now. Pause me and try to identify these. Okay, so hopefully we did that. And if we go through, we can identify magnesium's by itself. It has to have a zero. For water, when we're assigning our rules, we're gonna end up with hydrogen being plus one, ah, plus one. And then oxygen being minus two, and that works out because there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. So two plus ones and a minus two make a neutral molecule. Then we go to magnesium hydroxide, we know magnesium has to be a plus two because it's a group two metal. Then hydroxide overall is gonna to have to be a minus one because it's a polyatomic. And we can end up then with plus one and minus two. And two minus ones gives you a minus two overall which balances out the plus two. And then hydrogen here has to be a zero because it's by itself. So now let's look at what changed. So what changed was magnesium went from zero to plus two. And our hydrogen, some of it went from plus one to zero. 
And some stayed the same. Some went plus one to plus one with no change. And our oxygen stayed minus two everywhere. So it's not answered anything. So it has to be the magnesium and hydrogen that we're worried about. So oxidation is loss of electrons. So if we look, magnesium goes from zero to plus two. It becomes more positive. That means it has to be losing a negative charge. So in this case, I lost my pen again. There it is. Our magnesium is going to be what's oxidized. Put question marks on these. Because it lost electrons. Our hydrogen, on the other hand, went from plus one to zero. So it gained an electron. So hydrogen is what is reduced. And then for the reverse of the question, what is the oxidizing agent? What caused something else to lose electrons? Well, that's going to be my hydrogen again because the hydrogen gained, so it had to take them from something. On the other hand, our reducing agent is going to be magnesium because since it's giving up electrons by losing them, it's giving them to something else. Also, in terms of how you word it, when I say what is the oxidizing agent, you would probably actually say it as the overall thing. It's water because this is the molecule you have. So it's the addition of water that caused something to be oxidized. So wording-wise, you might see it as it's water that causes the oxidation to happen. So it's the overall molecule, whereas it is the actual hydrogen atom that's being, as part of the compound that's being reduced here. It would also make sense for the agent to be the part that's on the reactant side because we're thinking of what caused something to occur. So the transition happens across towards the products, but it's the initial magnesium and water that actually caused this change to occur. So... With that, that finishes up the work on oxidation reduction. I want to strongly encourage you practice these some because getting those rules down takes practice that when you first hear them, it feels overwhelming. There are these seven rules and at least the seventh one has like a list of six and that can feel really rough. But as you do them, you get used to those rules because they keep being applied the same way. There aren't that many examples, honestly, we can work through. So you get used to, okay, this is how these molecules tend to work. This is what the charges tend to be. And you get used to those and they get really systematic and that can help make them a lot easier to do. So I want to strongly encourage you to practice these, to do a few, that it is very difficult to just listen to me and be like, okay, I got this. So do some of the practice I have assigned. Um, remember, I've got those extra practice problems on your chapter review guides, as well as the exam review video stuff too. So make sure to use those as well as what we get from class. And with that, I hope this goes well, and I will see you at my next recording.